baby to another says, I'm lucky to have met you. Warning. The following podcast is another wasted hour. Warning. The following podcast is another wasted hour. Don't waste my motherfucking time! Well, this should be yet another interesting week, as we have moving parts at all times. As you know, this is another wasted hour. Instead of a productive hour, it will be replaced with, well... One ignorant, uninformed, ill-advised, self-deprecated moron ranting about opinions that I have no right to have, which are probably wrong and absolutely do not matter. I know you're probably wondering why there aren't two. We'll get to that. Our goal is to convince you that where we hail from just outside Washington, D.C. is not just a city of politics and scandals, but one brimming with art, music and culture. As impossible as that may seem. So, listeners, now that you know why you're here, I'm Keith, and not across from me is my co-host, Victor. Victor, why aren't you here this week? Yeah, no, that wasn't going to work. I knew it. So, uh, as those of you who have been following along with the show, you might know that uh, Victor uh, has been practicing uh, his parenting skills uh, for the last uh, few weeks and months, uh, leading up to a moment where uh, he was going to have a baby, and that is has happened there's a baby in the world that shares some form of his genome which may or may not be illegal so um unfortunately i'm i'm riding solo today uh we didn't have our guests last week uh the raw who uh unfortunately weren't able to join us and so this week i thought oh well we'll be perfect we would uh have great guests in studio and we'd have uh, my dear friend victor in studio and then he didn't show up so, uh, without further ado, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and pull back the curtain and introduce you to our guest, since I have nobody else to talk to, uh, Joshua Rich. Yay. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks. Really nice to be here. Yeah. So uh, Those you, babies can be so darn distracting. They, they just can just take a lot of time. They can. They, they, um, they, uh, they just won't... Uh, <laughs> They won't respond. That's yeah, you just can't leave them alone for too long. It's really, it's a drag. It takes a while before you can go out again. Uh, they're hard to walk <laughs> they, at that age, too. Very hard. At there are one, new baby leashes out, I yeah. Heard, but yeah, they're still testing them out. It's uh, <laughs> If you try to take a one-day-old out for a dra- <laughs> uh, for a walk... Doesn't it, go well. It's a real drag. <laughs> uh, so, it's... Um, <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so why are you here this week, Josh? I am here because Joshua. you're a nice person. You invited me on your show, and I get to plug some things that I'm doing and talk a little bit about myself and uh, hopefully get some people interested in checking out my music. Yeah, well, well, hopefully we will be able to do that. Uh, you have a, a pretty big show coming up on Sunday, October 29th. Yes, that sir. Right? That is right. I'm What's doing going a, on? a CD release uh, concert of my new album, Come On Over, which has... 14 tracks, uh, which are all technically new, but some are not new, but to the world they're new. And uh, <laughs> right. we're promoting a couple of singles off of there. And um, yeah, really excited to be promoting it. So, Well, I've done that a few times where you have uh, like songs you've had for years, right. but you've never actually gotten them down and recorded them before. Right. I think these are things you've probably played at shows before, right? Right. Well, these I'm I'm a little I'm a pretty we were talking off air about being prolific. I'm actually very prolific, almost to the point of just pain because I have so much material. But these were songs that w- have been recorded. In some cases, were even released in other forms. But I have a new album deal, and I sort of got reorganized, and I took 14 tracks that I thought were the strongest. We both kind of agreed on what the strongest were, so they've been reconstituted as this album. But some of the material was released earlier, so um, yeah. So no, now re- repeat that just for a second. You sure. said what happened? I some of the songs have been released in other forms. No, like but other. what was what was the impetus for this? Did you say there was a deal? Oh yeah, yeah. I have a new record deal out with the. That's company. fantastic. There we go. I got to keep on. You're like, let's talk about that. That's interesting. Um, yeah. I it's called SRI Jazz Records. They're out of California. Okay. Um, the president of the label told me that he met. Duke Ellington, who told him, "Wow, what did he say?" He said, "There's Duke Ellington said you need to sign Joshua <laughs> yes. Rich to a contract." <laughs> I now. think the time frame of that wouldn't quite make sense, but yes, <laughs> that would be awesome. Uh, yeah, he's like, I heard this really cool cat named Joshua. You gotta, you yeah. gotta find him. <laughs> I, I got good, good feeling about so him. So they asked me to. Um, they're just a really cool. And there's another thing to plug, which actually people out there listening might not know about, is called the Indie Bible. Which, yeah. Do you know oh, about yeah. That? yeah. Absolutely. Really great resource. And Used that years ago when we yeah. were doing touring and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just so yeah, to call a bunch of phone numbers that nobody would pick <laughs> exactly. up. Exactly. It's really very heartening. <laughs> very heartening to do. But at least you have the phone numbers and you feel more productive. Like, right. well, we didn't get anywhere, but at least we made ourselves feel like we were to- working. Yeah. Today I left 24 <laughs> voice messages that yeah. I will never hear from. Excellent. 
I'm a rock star. <laughs> So <laughs> and he's just summed up the whole music business in one sentence. Right. No, but it it does pay off. You just have to be uh you know diligent about it. You do get responses. He's just kidding. You do get somewhere. But um yeah, I this... like just leaving messages that are non sequiturs <laughs> when you just start getting frustrated and you're just right. like, "Uh hi, just calling um uh, about booking your venue. Oh my god, my feet are on fire. I got to go." Right? That, just to make yeah. their life go. What? Wow. That would make them want to call you back. You're yeah. supposed to leave cuz they get 3 million phone calls. That's funny. Yeah. Like, I just wanted to check on your feet. Uh, is everything okay? I'm not going to book you, but god, that was an interesting message. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can we book your feet? Is that possible? <laughs> we have a whole new, feet? We have a whole new idea for a gimmick for a band. We want a band with their feet on fire. <laughs> oh my god. Were men with hats. <laughs> and, yeah. And now we need feet feet with fire. Feet, feet on fire. Um <laughs> Yeah, no. So they responded and they asked me for like a bunch of tracks to listen to. And I pulled together what I thought were the strongest. And so I sent them over and they sifted through and picked the 14 that they really liked and put them in okay. this album. And then I have another five singles that on my own I've released sort of just through CD Baby and just kind of that are out there too. So kind of technically about 20 new songs that are out there wow. for the world. But in addition, I have a bunch of albums available on my website. I've got a bunch of material still yet to be recorded. Uh, a lot of new stuff. So yeah, very a lot of a lot of material. A lot and of if, a lot of little kids in the basement that need to go out and be, be <laughs> and allowed if, to go play. If people want to check out some of that music, uh, they can go to www.joshuarich.com. They may indeed do that. Yes, which is spelled the way it sounds. Exactly. If you know how to spell Joshua and you know how to spell Rich, you're in luck because you can get to this man's website. You might be surprised how many people have a trouble with the word Joshua though. So really? we might want to spell it just in case. Yeah, some I, I've I've been surprised how many people say, "Can you spell that for me?" Really? I think some people get confused with the H and the S. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is surprising. Right? Right, but I don't want to cast any judgment. So, but yeah, J O S H U A. It makes you wonder how many people are out there right now listening to like Joshua Tree, <laughs> right? Like they know this isn't people, really as good an yeah. album as people are saying. I've I've heard good things about it, but <laughs> when you put a G when you put a T in there, it's just not as yeah. compelling. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. That's fine. <laughs> so. Uh, if people would like to hear the track, you brought us a track uh, called Agitated mm -hmm. from this album, yes. uh, which is Come On Over. Right. Um, if people want to hear this particular track and you don't have any patience at all, right now what you can do is stop this <laughs> podcast, take a note of where you are, go to the one hour mark, uh, take a listen to the entire track, uh, come back, and now you'll know exactly what Josh sounds like when he's singing. Um, maybe later we'll just try to make him do that here in the show. Sure. Um, but uh, I think that that's an interesting thing that a lot of people don't actually get to experience is uh, signing a deal and, mm -hmm. and actually going through that process. But more importantly, you have uh, people who are of kind of of consequence looking through your portfolio of music and choosing like the ones that are good. Right. What is that like to have somebody who hasn't been there the whole time? With an objective view, kind of say, well, these 14. Like, Well, that's a really good question. I, I think, and you were talking to me before we went on the air about me being an actor, too, which we can talk about, too, later. But becoming an actor has helped me get outside of my head. And I'm sure you can relate to this. Where, well, we were talking about this, too, as far as your concerts should be an event. There should be something for the audience there. It shouldn't sure. just be like, yeah. I'm on stage, and that's why you're here. It's like, you're welcome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the Joshua Tree. <laughs> or the Joshua Tree, whatever. Um <laughs> And so in acting even more than in performing, I've gone, I've gotten good at, at seeing what other people see me as. So okay. it's helped me be really like take my ego out of it and welcome the objectivity of like, what do I'd rather someone else tell me what they, what song they like right. and what, what they think is the hit. Um, because then it's really valid rather right. than, no, this is the hit. It's like, okay, it's a really good song. And not every song I'm going to write is going to be a hit. Sure. Quote unquote. I think most of what I write is really good, but not everything just hits somebody because hits are just these magical, who knows why they're a hit. Right. So it's actually, it was refreshing to sort of like, I knew they liked me and I knew they wanted to work with me. And they're a smaller independent label. So I felt good about their energy and everything. Yeah. But it was kind of cool to say, okay, here's 20 of my babies. Which ones do you want to pick? And it was also, it's also so interesting when you hear what other people think about you or how they see you or you know when people compare me to different people and who they who they hear in the music because yeah. you're so inside yourself as a musician sort of with preconceived ideas or what have you so it's actually uh, been something i welcomed that process i kind of liked so for those of people who haven't jumped ahead to listen themselves how would you describe yourself uh, to those folks so that they 
uh, have an idea listening to the music, kind of what is you step outside of yourself and see yourself as other people do. How do they see you musically? Um, the the biggest uh, response I get is my energy. People really love my energy. I'm very, very high energy, very engaging and very real. I'm sort of like the old school Frank Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. world of people oh, okay. who, really, who really entertain and really yeah. want to. Um, that's what people in their twenties, thirties, forties, and more are responding to first and foremost. Like I'm a piano virtuoso. I can do amazing things on the piano. However, it, even more so than that, people just like that. And I like a 19 year old at a show recently said, we just, we, I wish our generation had someone like you, like you're so real and you're so authentic. And I think there's been this, I think there's this kind of thing happening where people are kind of a backlash to how much technology we have and yeah. how perfect everything can sound. Sure. Oh, they, absolutely. They want that real I want that real sound. So that's, I think I'm just, I'm a universal, I have a universal appeal. And then my tagline is sort of like a jazzy Billy Joel. Oh, okay. Just because that gets people's heads around, around, but it, yeah. I think it's a lot deeper than that. So would you, uh, uh, do you, have you ever gotten a compliment where you feel like maybe they're just like appeasing you? They're like, oh, you got good energy, but they avoid saying like, you're very good at what you do. Like, I've always wondered, like <laughs> if somebody would just come up and be like, man, great show crazy hat you know like and like like <laughs> you know actually to tell you the truth what happens is i think what i do in the piano is really it has to be seen to be believed and i think people sometimes just don't know how to respond to the magic that they're seeing and so oh, they, they okay. will sometimes i'll get like my son plays the piano too or my mm -hmm. son i'm self-taught okay and so and i'll just be like playing these amazing things and people will just be like their right. mouths will be dropping and then at the end of the show someone will come up and say my son taught himself how to play the piano too and i'm like I don't know why you're putting me on that, you know, but I heard a story, <laughs> I heard a story about Lionel Richie on a plane. Yeah. And apparently the stewardesses came up to him and one of the stewardesses was like, we're in a band too. And we sing too. And they were like putting themselves at his level. So I, I think people need to do that to get well, their heads around. I think they want to relate, yeah. right? At some point you want to be able to be like, oh, wow, this is, yeah. look, I, I really, you've told me all of your stories right. through your music. Here's a story that I have. And it's, Maybe not as poetic, right. but I, I play good. I play piano, you know. Like I used to take yeah. it as sort of that they weren't taking me in, but now I'm looking at it more like that. Like they want, yeah. and that's the whole thing about giving something to somebody else instead of like, why is it about me? It's like, what is it about that? Per what is it? What's in it for them? What did they get out of it? So if that's what they want to, if that's how I reach them, I just want to reach them. Well, so as long as I reach them somehow, I'm happy. You're in luck because I've got something I'd like to give you today. Okay. Uh, so this is a little segment that we call the weather report. Yay. Were you? Get to be get to for a moment become a news editor, which okay. is probably something you've never done before. I have right? not done that before. Okay, yeah. so I'm gonna we I've gone around. That'd be funny if I had been a news editor. And you're like, yes, I'm that's the one what, guy. That's no, what actually, I do. Yeah, exactly. I'm, that's, that's my yeah. I'm I'm actually but, a news editor, <laughs> piano player. That's my gig. Um, so I went around the internet. I found uh, news from all over the internet that okay. I found quite uh, compelling and interesting. And then you, in your infinite wisdom and knowledge as a brand new news editor, you're going to let me know uh, if it uh, whether or not it is news. And then uh, feel free to share maybe why. If you can also just say no, um, that's that's perfectly legitimate. Okay. Usually, what we do is Victor and I uh, will kind of. Um, uh, be competitive about these things, but I've right. got a really good feeling I'm going to win this week. So, <laughs> because he's not here, by yeah, the way, everybody, well, he's just, he's saying that because nobody's here. So I'm just, just saying you kind of win easily when the other right. person doesn't show. It's like, but 75, no, and I like that you're not competitive at all. That's good yeah, too. You're not. You're seventy five percent chance I'm going to win. <laughs> Uh, well, so, how do well, how do you determine who wins? By the way, I don't think I understand that part. Well, I win. Oh, and by then how I, many stories they realize? Yeah, what, it do, what we determine it by. Uh, I always win, and sometimes I tell him he won to make him feel better. <laughs> uh, I see. Well, that explains. Yeah, it. and so uh, yeah. It's so an, this week you get to just legitimately win without any. Exactly, yeah. I get to. I so get there's to, no chance of me winning. Is this because I'm a little competitive? I'm just you're wondering. always the winner, okay, Joshua. Great. Uh, all right. <laughs> so you're the man in charge. So, uh, all right. Uh, I've already won, apparently. Yeah. A man fed up with nagging wife hides in forest for 10 years. <laughs> in America, we sometimes see divorce as the most obvious end to an unhappy marriage. One uh, gentleman in Britain found a less costly option with far less documentation. He went to live in the woods for 10 years. Three years into his marriage, he found that his wife was nagging him a lot about their lack of quality time. He apparently found her complaints to be unreasonable and went to spend quality time with a couple of other men in the woods and has recently come out of the woods and is now a caretaker for a property where his wife does not reside. 
I'm going to definitely say I don't believe that is a true story. That is a true oh story. Oh, my God. The part I thought made yes. it not true is that there were other men. That is from the New Zealand Herald. <laughs> that, not only is there one man, but there were three men that have done it. Well, because wow. one of them said, I'm going to leave and go spend 10 years in the woods to get rid of my wife. And the other guy was like, oh, my God, that's a great idea. I'm also going to do that. And then somebody else was like, what are you guys talking about? It's like, we're going to the woods for 10 years. So our wives down now. He's like, holy shit, how do I get in on that? That's unbelievable. Yeah. There's a lot to unpack in that story. I don't know where to start. So probably best to move on. <laughs> so it, uh, there's a lot to unpack, but is it news? So you mean, so these are all going to be true stories, but I'm supposed to tell you whether they're newsworthy. Yes. Are they news? Oh, I understand. I'm Does sorry. Does this um, go in the uh, Joshua Rich uh, Joshua Yes, Rich I think those Gazette. that would be a newsworthy show. All Should right. I tell you why I think so? I feel, yeah. If you well, know. I think there's a lot. There's so much in there, but just to begin with, like the lack of communication skills that they have <laughs> where they can't yeah. just talk to their wives <laughs> and that the extreme level that they went to to get out of the relationship just shows a lot of kind of lack of evolving uh, you know, uh, lack of involvement there. Oh, yeah, evolution has, has <laughs> maybe just... flashed, flashed past that particular I, village. I, I, yeah, exactly. And they were and like, I would, "Oh, so I would love to hear. <laughs> I'd love to hear from the women and 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 then how do they survive? That's an interesting question. And, <laughs> right. And did the women ever find out? And uh, yeah, there's yeah, that's why they I'm probably here. just were like, "We're loggers now. We're just <laughs> we're loggers. Yeah, we have to go log <laughs> for ten years." Um, just sending notes. Hey, sorry, I can't be there. Still logging. Yeah, and then there's the questions like, did they have like a the, like a campsite there? Did they live I like know. literally in the woods? Did yeah. they, you know, come into town to get their things? But where was that? The Netherlands? That was uh, no in Britain. Oh, Britain. Wow. Yeah, that was in Britain, mm. but it was uh, in a. It was in the New Zealand Herald is where it was reported. <laughs> they just run into each other at the grocery, picking up acorn nuts. Like, oh, honey, hi. Oh, uh, oh, where have you been? Soccer, oh, yeah. Um, just. Uh, what was the part of the story where you said in three, after three years she that he came out something about they that he saw his wife after three years for no their, after three years of being unhappy he left for ten uh, years <laughs> and now he's back out and is a caretaker for a property where his wife does not reside <laughs> which I think is amazing because <laughs> now he's had to like come up with another story right like oh, I I would come home but I've got to yeah. there's a place I got to look after the and, lengths he went to yeah. I and mean, that's an amazing... You can't be there because there are uh, bees. There's bees. Yeah, apparently separating is too hard. Like, breaking up is <laughs> yeah, too hard for this man. He right. didn't... That was too difficult. You couldn't like just going go... to the woods for 10 years, and that, yeah, yeah. That, that was easy. You couldn't go like, oh, I don't know if this is working out. <laughs> it was just, uh, I'll be back. It's just... <laughs> just gone. <laughs> there won't be any phones. I... Gotta go. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Well, yeah. that's bizarre. Uh, all right. Wow. That <laughs> brings us to our next story. Uh... This one's very troubling because we know that there's a lot of issues with um, current uh, climate control issues mm -hmm. and things like that. Apparently, one of the larger worries for, well, a worry for climate scientists, uh, unbeknownst to me, is oyster flatulence. <laughs> Were you aware of this? I was not. This, Happily, I can yeah, say I wasn't aware of that. Things that are contributing to global warming, cars, obviously, right. factories, you know people just being assholes uh, and apparently shellfish farts that's wow. up there on the list a uh, study published in the scientific report journal shows that clams mussels and oysters produce one tenth of uh one tenth of me of the methane and nitrous oxide gases in the baltic sea as a result of digestion so a tenth of everything 10 percent of all of the nitrous ox oxide coming out of the Baltic Sea is because of shellfish farts. Well, I have several responses. A, no, I don't think that's newsworthy. B, no. B, I pity the person who had the job of tracking that. Because what is that like? Hopefully yeah. it wasn't unpleasant. Because that person then had to stand in front of a microphone and say, uh, and I quote, uh, shellfish may play an important but overlooked role in regulating uh, greenhouse gas production. Yeah. And people I don't had know. to be like, no. <laughs> yeah. And just whether it was an unpleasant experience for him to have to track that particular, maybe there's no odor to it. I don't know. That just seems very disturbing. I've never, yeah, I've never seen like an oyster bubble. No, I, right? Like, <laughs> I don't know where that happens. I yeah. think with all the problems we have that we're addressing in our world, I think sure. that I would put, just put that lower on the list of things to be. So, but it's so much easier to solve, right? <laughs> that's true. I mean, we can kind of blame the Torah. A I little mean, do bit. they need better? Digestion? What's? How do you solve? Are they? Are they just, not eating well? You, you eat them. You eat them all. <laughs> 
And then there's okay, no there more farts. Yeah. So the solution is eat more shellfish. And, yeah. So we have to talk to our Jewish friends and be like, I know in the book it says no, but this is, yeah, we're in dire you're times. You're doing this for the country, for the right. world. Yeah. You need to eat shellfish sure. because they shouldn't be alive. <laughs> They're terrible things that are farting. Then there are going to be the, the support groups for the endangered species of shellfish. They're going to come along though. So we're going to have a whole nother pr- problem on our hands. Yeah. All right. So not news. That's what I, I heard. would say. Not news. All right. Fair enough. I may not subscribe yeah, to your like magazine. I might, I might be losing on that one. I can <laughs> All right. Uh, man led uh, state troopers on chase because it was, quote unquote, on his bucket list. <laughs> Which I think may be the best excuse I've ever heard to get out of a ticket. Like, you're what? sure you're not getting these out of the onion? Yeah, I wanna, no. Okay, I just want to make sure. No. Uh, the driver was <laughs> Frederick Ray Jones, 46, of Des Moines, uh, Iowa, and was taken to the Polk County Jail, obviously. He was charged with OWI, first offense. Not sure what that is, but eluding. Uh, oh, it's eluding interference with official acts. That's what OWI stands for. So basically, like getting away. And then I thought it might have stood for off your rocker. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. apparently I wasn't wrong. Okay. Uh, operation without a registration, unlawful use of license, speeding, and well, a parole violation. <laughs> But apparently this was on his list. He was like, I want to be on a high speed chase. And so he's that's one check. Hopefully the other check was like, I wish I could spend the rest of my life in jail. (laughs) Jail. (laughs) That's uh, I wish I could see the inside of courtroom. That's going to happen. Want to spend a lot of money on a a lawyer. Done. (laughs) Right. Like, oh, my God, that's funny. Yeah, yeah so. that's another man I'd like to interview and ask questions of, but I, I, my head might explode with the answers. Uh, I'd say that's newsworthy. That's pretty yeah. interesting. He was uh, apparently doing this after spending ten years in the woods. <laughs> no, and he just got so so bored. <laughs> right. No, he's a uh, not the same guy, but because Des Moines, Iowa, is not in Britain. Well, you said it's a parole violation, so he'd already been in trouble. That's true. Yeah, he may not be making the best choices already. Yeah, exactly. So, well, all right. I so, wonder if he was kidding and they actually thought it was serious. And he just was like, <laughs> it became a story. Right. Or if he just pulled out the bucket list and they're like, <laughs> you know why I pulled you over? Like, yep, got it. <laughs> Nailed it. If you check my trunk, you can not cross <laughs> yeah. off another one of these. <laughs> I murdered a hooker. <laughs> like, oh, God, why are you alive? Yeah. Being insane. Just check that one off your yeah. list, too. Yeah. <laughs> Having no brain. All right. On to the next. Wow. Here's some news. Joshua Rich. You might be a snack food in Japan. <laughs> there is a chance. Please explain. Well, it happened in Nicolas Cage. <laughs> so I uh, in you know, in the United States, we often see promotional items for movies and things like that. You right. know, Avenger themed food snacks or like a Coca-Cola Coca-Cola bottle with like a cartoon character's face on it. However, usually it's considered tactful to inform the actor that his or her face will be plastered on said food product and legal it's apparently yeah. it's legal to do that not so much in japan yeah in japan they they don't feel so burdened by that <laughs> and uh so nick cage recently found out that his face is going to be on a puff rice stick uh <laughs> snack ahead of the series uh the release of his movie army of one uh so he did not know that they just did it um Apparently, the movie in Japan is going to be called Bin Laden is My Prey. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Which... I, st- I still don't know where they got the cross promotion to put a, right, a rice puff thing. Yeah. How, how that tied into the movie, but okay. I, yeah, I don't know. It's like putting his face on a baby Ruth or something. Right. Yeah, I, I'm not like, sure. How does that tie into it? Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so they're going to do a whole push for it, which seems weird because it sounds a lot like a movie that's going to go straight to DVD. Right. Um. So... There's a chance. Now it's a small chance. Right. But there's a chance that right now your face is on a That's like, a heartening thought, actually. Yeah, and the more I know I get, I'm looking forward to that. Because they didn't tell him and they didn't tell you. <laughs> Coincidence? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's funny. So I does it say how he found out? Uh no. I mean he just I, I assume that it's publicist said I just ate your face <laughs> in Japan. I mean, it something. depends on how you look at it. I, I, I just feel like it's what a compliment that he's that well known that somebody would want to use his face on something and that somebody would find that out. So it's kind of a good problem to have that kind of fame that, you know, you could even be considered to be used for that. Yeah. I don't know if I would go to the trouble of like suing someone like that because I think it's just such a compliment. I think I would try to use it as a publicity, you know, and, and work with them because it's such a funny kind of cute idea. But uh whether it's newsworthy, no, that one I would say probably isn't newsworthy. Here's here's my second <laughs> follow-up question. I really have no idea whether these are newsworthy or not because they're all so bizarre. Yes. So, hypothetically, mm-hmm. 
If you go to Japan one day right. and you find a puffed rice stick snack right. with your face on it, would you eat it? <laughs> huh? Uh, I'd have to consider that for a while. I think yeah. so. Probably, yeah. You would, you would eat your face? I, I, I would, just so I could say I, I ate my face. <laughs> well, there I you think go. I would go to them and ask them to put it on something cooler and more like, you know, <laughs> yeah, just like... cool. Like put it on like a... <laughs> soda or something or put it on like some kind of cool food but yeah well for them rice sticks are probably pretty cool yeah like, those are true. pretty popular right so it might just be honestly a... at this point in my career i'd be so happy that they knew about my face enough to put it on something that i would be happy but oh yeah it oh. would be odd to eat my own face i have to be honest about that uh all right let's see I've that's got a, a question i never thought i'd be asked by the way in my whole life so now i've i can check that off my bucket list uh all right i've got a, a couple others <laughs> okay. uh that i think are are gonna be really good um uh let's see oh oh from russia forensic exam confirms that six-year-old victim of car accident in bashlika was sober so that's good <laughs> good detective work there the russia's investigative committee has announced oh the results God. of a comprehensive forensic examination ordered with ordered with the aim to find out whether a six-year-old boy run over and killed by a car driven by a woman motorist in a residential neighborhood of bashlika I'm not saying that right. Uh, near Moscow last spring was sober. Um, the original forensic examiner produced controversial and suspicious looking conclusion that the boy was heavily drunk. Apparently the alcohol they found out uh, seems to have been added post-mortem. So we're not sure what was going on wow. there. I'm guessing that the, the examiner was like, I'm uh, going to have to see if this going to do the, the oh I spilled my vodka on the baby and so well, I wonder if the woman who ran him over put some in him or something <laughs> right. or on him to drink this well, you dead to come, body well to well to make it look like maybe he had been drinking and then she, she wasn't at fault <laughs> I, that's all I can think of that's a yeah. terrible story on so many levels well welcome so the poor to parents, Russia the poor parents who have to learn not only is your son gone but you know we're doing I mean that's terrible that's just a terrible terrible horrible story. yeah so is it news. Or is it just what happens? Okay, what's the criteria of whether it's news? I just you get to decide. I just it's get completely to up to you. Uh, You're the news editor. No, I would be too sad to air that, so I'm not going to air that. <laughs> okay, no. all right. That's too terrible. Uh, two more. We're running a little behind, but that's okay because we don't have anything else to talk about. So, a <laughs> uh, man rescued from Taliban didn't believe Donald Trump was president. <laughs> A Canadian couple rescued from the Taliban-linked group in Afghanistan, a Taliban-linked group in Afghanistan, last week said that their captor, they thought their captors were joking when they told them that Donald Trump had been elected president of the United States. They did this for a proof-of-life video. They said, you know, the president of the United States, Donald Trump, is going right. to want to see this. And right, right, they right. were like, yeah, what <laughs> kind of torture is this? This is really weird torture. And um, <laughs> so... They, when they finally rescued them, you know, they said, oh, yeah, no, he's totally present. And they were like, really? really? Oh, wow. I should probably not laugh as loud. And um, yeah. I don't know. I, I I guess I would say that is that is newsworthy. Yes. I okay. don't even have any idea why. I'm just going to put that on as newsworthy. Can you imagine if it had been American, though? If they were like, because this is a Canadian. So he's like, oh, that's yeah. really weird. Wow. What? No. American could have been like, hey, we're we're rescuing you. We're coming. We're taking you back home where Trump is president. They're like, we're can I just stay here? Yeah. Is that cool? Like can I go back into the woods just for. Yeah, I'm just just a few years. If you could come back, <laughs> come back in like three years and then. Yeah, right around election. I want to vote. So um, seems like I can't trust you guys. It so. reminds me of the movie Sleeper with Woody Allen where they ask, about, <laughs> they ask about Nixon. There's some funny lines in there. So. All right. Last but not least. This is my favorite one. Oh, is that uh, news? You said that that is news. I would say that is not newsworthy. Not newsworthy. I think I you can see you mind. disagree. Yes. Yeah, I think you changed your mind. That's fine. That's fine. I might be losing this one after no, all. I have no idea. Uh, last but not least, uh, a quarter of a million dollar lawsuit claims that a newspaper story ruined a pimp's good reputation. <laughs> yes, not the thirty charges he was found guilty for for. Uh, leading to an 18-year prison sentence. Oh, not Lord. not the sexual assault or the exploitation or <laughs> sexual interference and human trafficking of 11 victims ranging in age from 14 to 19 years old. No, 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 no. No, and I quote the suit. Uh, words published in the Vancouver Sun newspaper and National Post newspaper ruined good reputation and character. They were either directly or inadvertently deflammatory, especially given that many of the alleged accusations were proven false in court. Hmm. 
There you go. Well, not enough for proven false that he didn't get all the other charges. <laughs> it seems weird, right? Yeah. So uh, the gentleman's name, uh, well, gentleman is a strong word. Reza <laughs> Mozami. His, uh, his defense essentially is that he was acquitted on a handful of the charges against him, including three counts of procuring his victims into prostitution. Granted, the 30 he was found guilty, uh, guilty of <laughs> included additional counts of procuring for prostitution and living off the avails of prostitution. So I'm not sure what the part was. I don't know. Seeing that yeah. he was abusing children and he actually even beat a small dog that one of his victims owned. I, uh, I'm kind of curious. What was the report that drew his era, his ire? Like, what was the thing that they said? So, uh, yeah. I'd like to put some things out there and just see if I can help this along. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, as another wasted hour, we're going to um, just report on some factual things about this gentleman um, that we may or may not have made up. So a fact, uh, Reza believes that the Shawshank Redemption is a mediocre movie. Just seen. We'll see if we get something from his lawyers. Uh, fact, uh, Reza drives on the shoulder to get past traffic. That is true. And we have sources that say uh, another fact, Reza uses cheddar cheese instead of mozzarella on his pizzas. Yep. All these things. It's getting worse. Yeah. Do you have any that you wanted to add? I'm thinking as you're yeah. going on, let me, let me, let me think for a second. So yeah, if there's anything you'd like Push, to add. He, Reza pushes uh, old women out of the way when he's crossing the street and doesn't help them across the street. <laughs> that sounds like him. Yeah. I, mean, I would believe that. I have that on, I have a document that proves that. So. Yeah. No. So yeah, unequivocally, these things are true. So uh, Reza, <laughs> if you'd like to sue us, please contact our lawyers at shut the fuck up, you piece of trash <laughs> at anotherwastedhour.com. So, Very well put, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua, is uh, is it news or not news? You know, the only reason it would be news is because he has such gall and incredible uh, chutzpah. But I would say no, because, I, again, I wouldn't want to give him any more publicity than he's already got. <laughs> All right. Well, because we, he's a terrible person. We have failed at that and given him more publicity. <laughs> exactly, no, exactly. So shame Good on Lord. us. Good Lord. But in the end, that is the end of our weather report. <laughs> Uh, thank you for participating. My I know pleasure. It's, it's hard that first day of being a uh, news. Yeah, uh, you know, you, you have to, but you have to be thrown into the fire. That's the only way you're going to learn. So. Yeah, I won by two. Just you but know. what's I just, just barely the whole winning the whole I criteria? I think is a very yeah. okay. Good. I'm glad you just pulled it out. I just it pulled it out. Okay. Good. Out of like what is it? Eight stories that we did. I. I only got two as news. <laughs> that so. makes me feel better, yeah. even though I have no idea why you could win or lose at that game. But that's good. <laughs> well, we want to be journalists when we grow up, so <laughs> there's always that. Uh, <clears throat> speaking of things that are obviously news, you are releasing a brand new album. I am at that. And that uh, that album is coming out on Sunday, October 29th at Gerana Coffee House. Gerani. Gerani yeah. Coffee House in Manassas, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Come On Over. We have a track called Agitated that you brought to us. Um, here's the most important question, right? Uh, this track, Agitated, has it ever been played on a podcast? No, it has not ever been played on so a podcast. So this is the podcast world premiere Yay. of <laughs> Agitated. Oh, this is very exciting. Has it been played on the radio? Do we, know, do we have radio? Uh, is it the world premiere overall? I think it may actually be the overall world premiere. Yes, <laughs> this actually. This is so exciting. I don't think it's had any radio I play. I know. We don't We don't get a lot of accolades, Joshua. <laughs> no, so I know. I want to. <laughs> I can tell how excited. He's very excited. You yeah. guys would have to see him to know. We, we take every little thing that we <clears throat> yeah, can you, here. You should, you should take that <laughs> and embrace it. But it's definitely true. Yes. So uh, what I want to do is play a little track uh, or a little snippet from this track. Okay. Um, if people want to hear... The entire track, they can fast forward to the one hour mark of this particular podcast, listen to it all, come back and join us. Um, but let's take a listen and have you tell you a little, uh, have you tell us a little bit sure. about this track okay. after people can hear what you do. So uh, this is Joshua Rich playing Agitated. You know, there's a lot of times that people will tell me what they sound like, right? They'll say like, well, you know, we're really hard to define or we're, 
we're pop punk or we're this yeah. or that. And you listen to it and you go, ah, yeah, yeah. not really. Yeah. Like I uh, pretty much either know exactly what you are or the thing that you think you are. Isn't This is pretty darn close to what you're talking about. That, that kind of seventies, eighties yeah. piano rock mm-hmm. that was really popular. There's a little bit of Elton John in there. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's definitely, um, uh, definitely some Billy Joel in there as well. That, that kind of feel, um, really comes across. It's almost a little bit of like a, a time capsule from that era, which I think is great. Cause that at one point is where, you know, uh, we had for the kind of one of the, the only times in uh, history where there was like arenas of piano, you know, like a piano player would go and play an arena. Yep. We don't see that anymore. Yeah. Even Billy and Elton now they play on digital pianos because the stadiums can't handle the sound of a real piano. So they have to be on digital. Oh, it's easy, right. It's yeah, yeah. Mic, so. But no. And there were like, you know, the listening rooms in D.C. and Roberta Flack played in Georgetown. And, right. Yeah. Also that. So, I mean, that's really what I'm finding too. You asked me what people respond to about my sound. I mean, they respond to my energy, but you know, I think they're responding to how real it is. Like it's yeah. very authentic and, and it, and it is very warm and it does harken back to that time. And, uh, it was a kind of second generation of singer songwriter. Yep. You had like the singer song uh, revolution that happened with, you know, um, uh, Bob Dylan, yep. um, and, uh, and that whole kind of, uh, like the generation California movement like yeah that. or or just the you know the the kind of the man or woman with a guitar and the truth kind of concept yeah. that that happened and then um and then we kind of got away from some of that you know because that was like 60s i would say right yeah late 60s early 70s you mean like the Joni mitchell james taylor yeah kind exactly of yeah. yeah yeah and then we kind of got into like more of the like crazy like you know um bigger bands bigger sounds yeah. you know crazier sounds and things like that um, and we got away from that kind of singer songwriter for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this kind of came on as almost a second wave of that mm-hmm. where now it was, uh, you know, you had men and women with pianos that were now kind of taking the stage mm-hmm. and having fairly like, uh, honest music and they bridged it. It was interesting because a lot of these artists had very like thoughtful, heartfelt music, but they also had really fun, energetic, uh, music and, uh, stage presences mm-hmm. to kind of tie it over from what that kind of arena rock kind of, you know, uh, feel was from the seventies mm-hmm. into kind of what this genre ended up being. So that's really kind of uh, fun. Wh- what brought you to that? Cause that's obviously not prevalent prevalent in today's music scene. There's not a lot of people doing it. So, well, I, you know, I just think my style just evolved. I mean, I listened to them when I was growing up, I listened to the Beatles. I also listened to a lot of uh, folk music and I listened to a lot of stuff from the thirties and forties. Okay. Uh, I'm very improvisational. I'm a self-taught pianist. I've never had a lesson in my life. And wow. I just started playing and singing when I was eight. Um, basically a child prodigy. Uh, and I think and I then just... it took you this long to get signed. Oh my God, yeah. Joshua, this is embarrassing. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of reasons for that. It's been a long and winding road. Well, I've been signed several times actually. Oh, I've okay, had, I've had right. other album deals, but I'm just giving you credit. But I am at a point of, of a newfound sort of confidence actually. So yeah. even though you're kind of joking, it has been a journey of like learning to believe in myself and get, get more confident. Um, I guess it's just part of it's part of my DNA, and I I just have always loved stories, and and I don't mean to sound like Billy Joel or like Elton John, but I mean I, people have heard Mozart in my improvisations, and they've heard Doctor John, they've heard John Denver, hmm. um, but mostly I think the I think the commonality there is warmth and like something real and something that's engaging for people. They really like right. what's happening. So um, yeah, I mean I feel like it's and I hope that it's timeless. I think it's I think you can put on something from the seventies or the forties. And it's it's still timeless because it's really good. I feel yeah. the same way about my music. People, I think it can be in any time. So, uh, yeah, I didn't really set out to necessarily try to capture something. I just how I've been writing my whole life. You um, said something yeah. really interesting. So you you know you mentioned that kind of coming up as a child prodigy in terms of piano, um, and then taking it kind of a long time to kind of be comfortable in your own skin yeah. in terms of of confidence. What what is that like? Uh, do you have any kind of words of advice for other people who are making music right now? Maybe in you know their basements or something like that and they feel like there's something there worth sharing but don't have that sense of confidence like how do you achieve that because it's something kind of internal right Mm -hmm. um so and it's a cyclical thing like if you if you're not going out and getting people's input because you don't have confidence then how do you start that wheel turning right to be able to to actually get that positive reinforcement that what you're doing is valuable I guess I just I just tell people I mean it's twofold. One is it usually comes down to deserving whether you think you deserve success, deserve accolation, accolades, deserve. 
to do it and you have to work on just why don't you deserve it and really there's no reason why you don't i mean everybody deserves to have something good like that yeah uh and at the same time um just just putting yourself out there so that you do get some kind of feedback and you do get that because that starts the ball rolling right but for me it was really learning about deserving and learning that um i had made decisions early on that it was somehow gonna not be good for uh certain people if i was able to make it and that i started, Interesting. somehow didn't deserve it because of that and these subconscious decisions i made so it's been a journey of just like learning to let go of all that stuff but it's it's kind of a constant thing where i still have to sort of talk to myself and say you know just ignore that voice it doesn't really serve you um but i think anybody who's trying to create this is the other thing i was going to say anyone who's trying to create something just know that that in and of itself is something you know, magical and cool that the universe is telling you, like, yeah, you have a reason to be doing this. So go ahead and share it. And even if you're just sharing it with your friends, some family, whatever, just try to get it out there somehow and be brave to do that. And, you know, mm -hmm. be brave to hear how people how people take it and and be happy. Try to trust yourself enough to what you are happy with, even if somebody says they don't really get it. Yeah. I mean, look at Picasso. I mean, like, I'm sure, oh, sure. He was, you know, yeah. And Van Gogh, who was totally like, you know, stepped over on the street corner, but he kept painting, he kept creating. So, a lot of people so. have this fear of th that there's going to be judgment yeah. or that they won't be successful or something, you know, that, that maybe they're not good enough. Mm -hmm. It sounds like your fear came at least partially from how it might affect people around you. What, yeah. what was that like? What, what was it that kind of drove that? Well, not to get too into a heavy topic, but um, I have just learned that my relationship with my uh, my mom primarily was a very non-affirming one okay. to where I was just basically neg neglected and completely ignored. So I, that in combination with being a little bit of an anxious person kind of made me grow up thinking, am I gifted? Do I have genius talent? Mm. I think I do, but yeah. everybody says I do. But then like, why is this main person in my life not affirming that right not excited about it not i mean just supportive to, yeah yeah beyond that just not even acting like it wasn't even there huh. it was a very odd so that's been that was the source of when i finally got that like oh that's the person i was sort of afraid of making mad or something yeah or you know unhappy i was able to really let go and a lot it's really just been the last few years and it's been a wow. huge since then i've had like this huge uh feeling of growth and just becoming much more you know much more um confident much more myself and just letting go of all those ghosts because they don't serve you and it's like life is way too short to be holding yourself back that's for... fantastic yeah i think thank you sometimes we don't realize how much our history affects who we are in the day-to-day -day. we're just kids really you know yeah. we're just bigger kids but we just you know we might get a beard we might you know we get taller but we're still kids and we we kind of forget that we're still like these tender human beings but we because we get bigger especially as guys we're not really given a lot of you know affirmation of like letting yourself show your feelings so it's hard yeah. i think mm -hmm. to just be like wow i still have stuff going on that was when i was eight or ten it doesn't mean that you're a victim it doesn't mean you're frozen there but it's like just acknowledging that there's still stuff there yeah that's tender that needs to be you know acknowledged so well i think that's fascinating we'll talk more about that and figure out uh, a little more of what makes you who you are in a bit uh, but speaking of history, I'd like to take a little bit of time nice to segue. go. Yeah, they, I like that. Uh, I'd like to uh, take a little bit of time uh, to go through this week in history. So I'm going to go through a bunch of things that happened this week in history. A lot of things have occurred. Um, and I want you to kind of take a listen to all those things and uh, decide again with your newsmaker cap on. What do you feel is the, the most important historical thing? Okay. Yeah. And I'll, really quickly, I'll say, speaking of brilliant geniuses who were not quite acknowledged in their own time here's scott joplin playing yes who yep. had a whole renaissance in the 70s and without which he might never never have been discovered but he's now you know considering him and you just hear him on every ice cream truck everywhere so i know just, just <laughs> interesting, yeah. interesting that that music was playing when you yeah no absolutely historic music uh all right so we'll start off in uh 17 uh 67 yeah my i know that you're looking at my whiteboard which oh i, I guess update. i shouldn't be okay so i should there, be listening. yeah you're not going to be able to see all <laughs> okay. of that that's from uh like uh several weeks ago I understand when Victor was here and then he stopped being here and he was on Skype and now he's not here at all because he has a baby he's walking so, that baby yeah. yeah so that all happened like probably a month ago okay so if you want to know what happened in history a month ago look at that white board I was really impressed that um because when I came in just for those of you who aren't seeing this that I came in he had this whiteboard and all the stuff was written I was like oh he's really prepared he's like all organized yeah. he's already so I was looking over there to see what I was going to be responding but apparently I'm, he's not as prepared as I, I threw you off <laughs> I am still oh, very no, no. prepared, I swear. But oh uh, no, you are definitely. <laughs> but we uh, we we aren't following that. One. That's what laptops are for. Uh, luckily, I don't have to like actually like have as many moving parts, so the big board isn't really needed because <laughs> I know what's coming next. Exactly. And uh, but it looks good. It's a yeah, cool. Exactly. So um, 
So we'll start in 1767. Any guesses? This is a good one. 1767. Something about the Revolution War? Oh, not bad. Not bad. Actually, uh, two gentlemen were hired by the Penn and Calvert families. Any idea who that is? Uh, I roughly know the Calvert family because when I grew up, there was a Calvert thing, but I don't know if it was the same Calvert. Okay. So uh, their names were Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon. Absolutely no idea. They completed their survey survey of the boundary between the colonies of Pennsylvania and Maryland, otherwise known as the Mason-Dixon oh, yeah. line, as well as uh, as well as the areas that would eventually become the states of Delaware and West Virginia. Mm-hmm. So throughout history, obviously, the Mason-Dixon line then became uh, known for uh, various different uh, reasons, especially you know between free states mm-hmm. and um, and with the uh, Civil War, yep. obviously. So, uh, but that thought was interesting. The headline I just wrote was Mason and Dixon draw a line. <laughs> the historical line. What I want to know is where those two words came from, which I feel like I knew. But if those two people were the names of who did it, where did Mason and Dixon come from? What do you mean? I thought you said it was Calvert and Penn. That's who hired them. Oh, so who Penn hired is, them. Yeah. So the, the Penn co- uh, family, I believe, owned Pennsylvania, or at least part of it. Sure. And the Calvert family uh, owned Maryland. Right. Uh, Which is why you see so many Calverts in Calvert County. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon oh, you said that. I'm are sorry. the ones who, who actually drew the line. So Mason Dixon. Um, 1814, London Beer Flood. <laughs> I feel like this one's going to rank high uh, on the historical importance. A beer vat at the Mew and Company Brewery ruptures, causing other vats to rupture in all... 1,470,000 liters, which would be 30, uh, 388,000 U.S. gallons wow. of beer spill into the streets, destroying homes and killing eight people. Oh, my gosh. But what a great way to die. To die. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Best way to die. You I mean, see the wall of you beer and you're like, die, yeah. take me. This is, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> no, the bad part is it was, uh, since it's in London, it was all lukewarm. So... <laughs> Yeah, that's but terrible. it actually destroyed houses too. Wow, yeah, that's incredible. That's so like the, it, was, it was a flood. It was literally a flood. It was literally a flood. It was wow. like, did you hear about the molasses uh, flood that happened up in like I think it was in Boston? <laughs> nope. There was like yeah. a forty foot wall, a wall of molasses that like wow. just killed like dozens of people uh, back in I think is the eighteen hundreds. Wow. They weren't good at holding things in vats. At well, our point. factories have come a long way. I think. That's I hope so. Safe to say. Yeah. Well, I haven't uh, heard of any beer floods recently, but... But we'd like to. You know, the next news thing you do, I'll have to keep an ear out, because who knows? Right. <laughs> You'd have to take time off work. I'm uh, uh, helping with the cleanup. Yeah. <laughs> There's a... Uh, Houston's in real trouble. There was like... Uh, yeah. I'll yeah. be back. You have a lot of people volunteering for FEMA. It's like, wow, we've never had this many people wanting to help before. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no we're That's really it. there. I brought glasses. Um, all right. 1860. Abraham Lincoln... Grows a beard. <laughs> ah, huh. There you go. An 11 year old girl writes the future U.S. president suggesting he should grow a beard. He wrote back saying it would be uh, saying it would be silly to start a beard, but he did so anyway. Huh. And then from that point forward, iconic. Do you want me to wait till after all of these and tell you which ones, or did you want to hear as like because I have to compare them all, don't I? You well, yeah. I mean, at some point you'll have to decide which one right. it is, but okay. it's up to you. If you you can feel free to chime in on things. They all, I mean, the first and that one, the first one and that one seem pretty. I would say those are pretty historically significant. There's beer in the second one. I don't understand well, why you're. Skipping I'm not really a that. beer drinker. I'm sorry. I go for the harder <laughs> stuff. So if it had been a vodka flood, you you would have been... Again, your criteria seems a little... I have to make sure... Like, historically significant in terms of, like, how many people got to get drunk on something, or historically... According to any criteria you would like. Well, if a bunch of beer just happened to flow out and it was a flood, I mean, that's... I don't see that 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 wasn't life-changing or... You know, but the beard, you know, those, Lincoln's beard and the Mason-Dixon line are two pretty iconic. For those eight people, it was really life-changing. <laughs> Fine, I feel bad. It's the second one then. Okay. <laughs> You've shamed me into it. All right, 1867. Uh, the U.S. formally takes possession of Alaska after purchasing huh. the territory from Russia for $7.2 million. Wow. That is less than two cents an acre. Wow. Imagine that. that. That's a hell of a farm. That's a quite a steal. Yeah, don't you think? Uh, it reminds me of when, you, you know, these companies buy ball, you know, ball clubs or, or stadiums or something. Mm-hmm. Um they actually the I, I forget all the details, but the gentleman that actually did the deal was actually like ridiculed for doing it. Hmm. 
So the public basically thought like we have just wasted all of this taxpayer money on this just desolate like sure. ice cube of a place sure. that nobody's ever going to live because right. it's horrible right. and it's just worthless and you went and spent money on it and gave it to Russia like ah right and then they were like and there's gold there and people were like you're fine thanks for doing <laughs> good that idea. good yep. job we're oh we you. also found oil yeah <laughs> look at all this seafood we love you <laughs> like not yeah. that money drives decisions mind yeah. you no but then everyone was like hey he's pretty smart actually now that no, he didn't know about that. <laughs> that There's reminds no me, you know, the whole story of Dulles Airport. And apparently Dulles, John Dulles had the idea to build Dulles Airport and everybody thought he was completely crazy. Mm -hmm. Like, why would anybody go to an airport so far away, you know? And yeah. now, you know, it's, it's just one of those stories, you know, where people have vision like that. Yeah. Vision. And so. Um, that's pretty, that's up there. Yeah. That's uh, up there. In, in the same reign of things, because we're very good at this. So we formally took possession of Alaska in 1867. Uh, which state is that, by the way? Do you know? Mm, I don't think it's the 50th. Mm. 48th? Mm. Uh oh. What do you got? I would guess it's either, it's somewhere between 48 and 50. <laughs> it's somewhere Can between I? 1 and 50. Yeah. No, no, I'm narrowing it down to 3. Okay. I mean, it has to be a later one. Yeah. Well, you, you're not going to, it's not was closest Hawaii without going most, over. We Hawaii, know that 50 <laughs> was, is right. the top. Was Hawaii the most recent? If you can tell me that, like, well, you can't tell me that. The, yeah, I, I, can't. I don't know, 49th. Yeah, it's okay. a forty ninth state. Yeah, f f well, you're ridiculing me. I'm like really close. You're like, come yeah. on, like, as if I was well, so. I, far. I didn't say the tenth, <laughs> right? But you can't say like it's one of the last three. Of well, course, it's one of the last three. It was like the continental U.S. and then a couple of others. Like, of course, true. it's one of those two, that's true. right? They it wasn't like Alaska, and they were like, right. "Holy shit, what's this, Delaware?" Okay, that one's the forty ninth. Like, they didn't discover one. No, that's true. That's 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 fair. <laughs> like next time we do a podcast, I will I will brush up on my geography because apparently was, that's important. I'm guessing that the time between like 48th and 49th was probably a distance. I don't know, but it was probably like it had is, to have been. They were like, we're seceding and now we're Utah or something. And yeah. then they were like, Well, I guess we're not gonna be doing much anymore. We got Mexico down there and can <laughs> Canada up there, and the hey, and the Russia was like, "Hey, we've got this shit land that we're not doing anything with. You want it?" And we're like, "Okay." Yeah. And they were like, "Ah, oh, great, forty nine, forty nine. Well, it's such an odd number. You know what? We let's, should annex something. Let, let's round it up." Yeah. And they were like, "Hey, good, good news, Hawaii. You're the fiftieth state." And Hawaii was like, "No, thank you." Right. And they're we're like, "Okay, thank uh, you." Nope, nope. We're definitely doing this. <laughs> yeah. We didn't say you had a choice. <laughs> right. Sorry. Well, in 1898, uh, we followed our normal pattern of things. U.S. takes control of Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah, one year after Spain granted Puerto Rico its self-rule and said, congratulations, <laughs> you're, you're your own country now. America said, uh, just a minute. <laughs> we have a different idea. We would like, you can be your own country. Could you just put this flag on your flagpole, please? Yeah, and, that's interesting. Puerto Rico is such an interesting place. I yeah. don't quite understand the whole thing over there. Yeah, it, it's because they're U.S. citizens, but then like they don't get any of the good stuff. Yeah, like I don't. And why can we they wanted vote to in the presidential election? I think they can. They can in the presidential. I election, think they can, but and, they but, don't have a representative. No, right? That's how it works. Right. So yeah. And why did we reference. want them? Like, why do we want Puerto Rico? Like, what was the asset there that we wanted? That's just interesting. I never really understood that. I'm I'm assuming beaches. We were like. <laughs> You know what? We the weather over here is terrible. Or the girls were cute. They just yeah. were cute girls over there. It's like, yeah, we like that look. We're just gonna anyway. I don't know. Like I, I think we just we <laughs> I think we just are like Well, they just did Hawaii. So like, you know what? We yeah. need some beaches. We already have fifty. We've got a round number. Right. So we're that, not gonna make them a state, but we'll Yeah. Yeah. And that one's over there. What about the people on the East Coast? Where right. can they go? Exactly. Right. I think we're just weird, like we just don't know how to handle ourselves. <laughs> right? It's kind of it's kind of like hoarders. We're like we're like hoarders of people. <laughs> Right. And so when anybody goes, um, this island is now free, we're like, I would like that island. Yeah. Like, we just, is it nearby? I like that. <laughs> yeah. What is that? Marshalls. That sounds lovely. I think I'll take those. You know, like there's the British Virgin Islands. And then, like, we're like, can could we have just like yeah. half of those? <laughs> just, can we make a deal? Like, we just love things near that, us. That's a funny image of like the country as a hoarder country. It's like, yeah. must have more. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's what we do. Uh, anyhow, so that that happened in nineteen or eighteen ninety eight. Eighteen ninety eight. Okay. Nineteen oh six, a shoemaker leads German soldiers in robbery. Hmm. Yes, this happened. William Voigt, 
a 57-year-old German shoemaker, impersonates an army officer by uh, creating a uh, officer uh, outfit. He right. makes it by hand, wears that, uh, goes up to I a think squad. They call it a uniform, by the way. A uniform, yes, yes, <laughs> costume. No, I knew you were trying to figure yeah. out an officer outfit. An officer outfit, an <laughs> officer coat, and. Uh, he goes up to a squad of soldiers and says, I need your help. And they all go, oh, okay. And then he goes and steals 4,000 marks from, I think it's like the city. I believe it was like this town. Oh, he made them like go somewhere and then he went and he robbed them. No, he went, they helped him. They went into like the like city hall. Wow. And they annexed the city hall. He took the money from it and then they left. He was like, oh, we have to do this thing. And all the soldiers were like, yes, sir, you know, because... Oh, he was pretending to be an officer, of course. I right. See. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, wow, he had a long criminal <clears throat> record, but uh, ended up, he humiliated the German army by exploiting their blind obedience to authority and getting to him, getting them to assist them in the robbery. Like, that, they helped him rob this thing because they said, oh, the general said I have to steal money from these people. And they were like, okay, because apparently at that time, this, you know, we're looking... Uh, 1906 before World War One. Right, they were they were st- already starting their their long held belief of if somebody tells you to do something horrible, just go ahead and well, do it. Well, that's why I would say that might be one of the most historically significant because yeah. there he is in 1906 trying to basically stave off World War Two and the Holocaust. That's an amazing right. If he, we had known, he saw that. Holy crap! They'll do just anything, like kill all these people. Yeah, if well, they, if you say so. I mean, I, wonder I guess what... we have to. <laughs> What he did with that information, like what, what did he send it out? Did he say to people, hey, look what I just got these people to do. Be careful. Like, don't, and I don't know. That's well, they put, that's pro- how- I like to think they put processes in place. Right. So Hitler was like, I need you to kill all the Jews. Right. And they were like, are you a shoemaker? And he was like, no. And they're like, OK. And then they killed all the Jews. Like that was the extra step. You had to make sure they that that wasn't a shoemaker. And that's, that's yeah, how there's World something significant about that one historically, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Speaking of shoes and shoemakers, 1960, the Khrushchev shoe incident. I don't know if you heard about this. Mm-hmm. At the United Nations Conference premiere of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev, Khrushchev. Khrushchev takes off his shoe and pounds a conference table, which at the time is just unheard of. Hmm. So people are like horrified by this. And they're like, use a gavel. And so, um, <laughs> And uh, and it became this huge thing, right, of him taking his shoe off, slamming it on the table. Okay, so you're not going to fall for I that. I wonder why. Yeah, that doesn't <laughs> seem very... All I mean, right. the Cuban Missile Crisis didn't come out of that. So I'm just saying, that. well, maybe you should look into it. Maybe. Maybe uh, there was a little... <laughs> uh, 1985, Penn and Teller, the magicians known as Penn and Teller, magically produce 500 live cockroaches and then let them loose on the David Letterman show. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did they really do that? That's yeah. funny. That <laughs> oh. sounds like them. Yeah. That's, a, that's that's an amazing group. Yeah, well, that's... No, not very historic. What? Today. I mean... Have you seen 500 <clears throat> cockroaches produced magically? Before? No, but it's compared, unprecedented. compared to Lincoln's beard and the Mason-Dixon line... There might have been 500 cockroaches <laughs> in Lincoln's beard. I, again, I think it depends on how you would you know define historically significant. But well, we need you to do that. That's... I mean, you know, there have been characters on David Letterman that I think maybe made more of a, made more of an impact on my life than... than uh, Fair enough. Even, even, his, even his writer's embellishment segment. I will... <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I will uh, I will uh, give you Plus, cockroaches are, are, are yucky. I don't want yeah. to think about cockroaches. Uh, all right. Uh, baby Jeff. Jessica rescued from a well as the world watches. Mm. And uh, that oh was pretty significant. I didn't realize we ran out of so much time. We're yeah. really running low. We're getting there. All right. I'm going to do stuff about you real quick. Uh, we didn't get to near and far. Can I have you back to do that? Sure. I'd be All happy right. to come back. Yeah. So super important. Josh Rich, Sunday, October 29th at Gerani Coffee Girani House, Coffee House right. Manassas, Virginia, CD release. For Come On Over, which is a song you heard is agitated. That'll be coming on here on the show in just a little bit. Go to www.joshuarich.com to hear more. Yes. Um, because that's super important. Come back. Once you have another uh, album coming out or stuff, let's talk more. We had a blast. So sorry we lost so much time. But okay. Thank you. We had fun talking. Uh, so uh, as always, uh, not a lot happening this week. So just go listen to our old shows. Like our posts, follow us, retweet us, share the show on twi- uh, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We cannot do this without you. So don't forget to review us on Facebook, iTunes, and Google Play. Thanks to Kevin Evinger, to McNally22, to Justin Rogers, Figmental Records, Alchemical Records, and Engineer Adam for all their contributions. 
Uh, thanks to Victor for not being here, so that I had to do this on my own. Thanks most of all to Joshua, uh, Joshua Rich, Rich for wasting a perfectly good hour with us. My uh, pleasure. With, last but not least, what was the most historical thing? Go. Lincoln's beard. Lincoln's okay. beard. Well, there you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been yet another wasted hour. And okay. if you just realize that, don't blame us. We warned you.